I'll give folks a few minutes to hop on. Um, as folks are gathering, I can give a rundown and I'll just give a review of it right before we get started. Um, thanks for joining. If you just hopped on, uh, we're doing a virtual scrum in response to the very damning Supreme Court decision to block President Biden's emergency student loan relief plan. Um, this is all on the record and we're recording it um, and we'll share the recording on Student Borrower Protection Center's YouTube channel as soon as it's ready. Uh, my name is Jackie Phils and I'm head of communications for the Student Borrower Protection Center. Um, so the way this will go, first we'll hear opening remarks from our incredible managing council and deputy executive director, Persis Yu. And then we'll hear from our other legal, legal experts who are also all incredible um, for initial takeaways. And then after that, I'll open it up for a Q&A. Um, if you haven't done a Zoom Scrum before, the way this will work is you can either put questions in the chat and I'll read them aloud to our experts for a response, or you can click the raise your hand button and I will call on you and then we'll unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question verbally. Um, throughout the event, if you do have any technical issues, um, or have trouble figuring out the chat, you can feel free to send us a message via email or if you understand the chat in the chat um, and our team will do their best to help you out. Looks like we're getting more folks. So I think we can get started in just a minute. Reminder again that we're recording this. Um, also, closed captioning should be available if you click the show captions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Cool. Hello, everyone. Getting a lot of more folks are joining, so I'm just going to give it one more minute. All right, let's get started. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, sorry if you already heard me say this, I'll try to keep it brief, but for the folks that just joined, uh, this is the virtual scrum in response to the Supreme Court's decision to block the very needed student loan relief plan that President Biden had announced. Um, this will be on the record and recorded. And um, the way that it will go is we'll first hear from our deputy executive director and managing counsel, Persis Yu, and then we'll hear from the other legal experts for initial takeaways. And then after that, we'll open up it up for Q&A. And you can put questions into the Zoom chat, or you can click the raise your hand button at that point, and I'll call on you, we'll unmute you, and you'll be able to ask your question verbally. Um, and closed captioning is available if you click the show captions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. So with that, thank you all for your patience and for joining us. My heart goes out to the 40 million borrowers who just got terrible news today and the rest of the country for the other tragic and shameful choices made by the court this season. We're not going away and this isn't the end. Um, so with that, thank you and I'll pass it to Persis to get us started. Thank you, Jackie. Um, hello everybody. And thank you for joining us today. Um, as Jackie said, I have a, a few quick words now before turning to the rest of the panel and then we'll close us off at the end. Um, but yes, so it's a it's a dark day, of course. Um, but since President Biden first announced his intention to cancel up to $20,000 
in student loan relief for the vast majority of borrowers, the opponents have been lining up to deny borrowers access to this vital relief using the courts. What we've seen in nearly all of the cases, the courts have seen through the political ploys and dismissed the cases. Um, but unfortunately, back in December, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear the two cases, Biden versus Nebraska, brought by the Republican officials in Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, South Carolina, Arkansas, and Iowa, and in Biden versus Brown, a challenge brought by two student loan borrowers in Texas and funded by right-wing dark money groups. Despite the, out the different outcomes in these two cases, both of the cases lack merit. Um, and in ruling against the President Biden's debt relief plan, the Supreme Court has failed to uphold its duty to the American people and impair the financial lives of 40 million Americans. Um, I'm proud to say, though, that I'm proud of how borrowers have been fighting back against these right wing attacks. Hundreds of borrowers rallied in front of the Supreme Court during oral arguments back in February. Borrowers are gathering right now to protest this decision. Back in January, an historic coalition of cities, states, and experts, including my three colleagues joining me now, filed more than a dozen amicus briefs with the U.S. Supreme Court in support of President Biden's student debt relief program. When Biden announced his intent to restart the student loan payment after implementing broad relief, he explained that the administration's monumental debt relief plan was a, a necessary first step to protect borrowers and pre prevent disastrous loan defaults and other financial distress. To help us understand the meaning and significance of today's ruling, I'm joined by three of the smartest legal minds I know who have been working tirelessly on this effort since before these cases were even filed. I want to introduce my colleague, Abby Shafroth, Senior Attorney and Director of the Student Loan Borrower Assistance Project at the National Consumer Law Center. Chavis Jones, Associate Counsel with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Amon George, Senior Counsel of Democracy Forward. Um, we're each gonna make quick statements and then we'll take your questions at the end. Um, thank you again all for being here. And Abby, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank, thank you, Persis, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so I, I think I speak for all of us here when I say that today's decision was truly heartbreaking. It's wrong on the law, and more importantly, it threatens the financial security of millions of low-income Americans who are struggling with unaffordable student loan debt. They were counting on this debt relief to be able to manage their payments when bills resume in September for the first time in over three years since this unprecedented pandemic began. To block President Biden's debt relief plan, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court today broke from existing precedent and well-established limits on the court's authority in order to allow these cases to even proceed. It then pushed aside the plain language of the law authorizing the debt relief program to invent from th thin air new limits on the Secretary of, of Education's authority to protect borrowers in the event of a national emergency. As Justice Kagan wrote in her dissent, in every respect, the court today exceeds its proper limited role in our nation's governance. In fact, the court today substituted its own judgment and its own views on policy for that of the president and for that of Congress. So who is hurt most by today's decision? Well, 43 million Americans are hurt. Um, and the people who are hurt most today are people who don't come from families with money, uh, people from low-income families who sought an education. That's who's really hurting today. The program offered the most relief, up to $20,000 in debt reduction to Pell Grant recipients. And Pell Grant recipients are, are students who, have, who show extreme financial need. According to the Department of Education, in recent years, more than three quarters of Pell Grant recipients came from families earning less than $40,000 a year. And almost half of Pell Grant recipients made less than $20,000 a year. Most of these students went to public universities and community colleges, and a generation ago, they would have been able to graduate debt-free while working perhaps only a small number of hours a, a week. What's changed? Well, states reduced their support for education, and the federal government uh, reduced its support for the Pell Grant program, and with Pell Grants failing to keep up with the rising costs of tuition and life costs. In the meantime, the minimum wage stagnated, so the amount that, that students can earn while, while working uh, and, and acting as students went way down. As a result, far fewer low-income people can graduate debt-free today. 
so uh, I think that today is a pretty bleak day, but there is some good news, um, which is that Americans continue to support debt relief. And today's opinion from the Supreme Court is narrow. It's limited to what the administration can do using national emergency authority under the HEROES Act. It does not address other potential sources of authority for debt relief, leaving those options viable. And with a massive wave of default and financial distress of at risk for borrowers without debt relief in September, it's clear that every option must be on the table to ensure that, that Americans with student loan debt relief can get the relief they need and can get it now. There's no time to wait and the administration must act fast to deliver promised relief to worried borrowers and to prevent the federal government from sending bills Americans can't afford to pay come September. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Uh, I agree with much of what my colleague Abby has said in this context, uh, and it's truly, truly a sad day for so many individuals who are hoping for student loan debt relief to change their lives, honestly, and who are bracing for the impact uh, of student loans once repayment begins. And so you have millions of borrowers all across the country who are now wondering what this will represent for their lives, for their livelihood, uh, for their children and for their economic stability from here forward. And so uh, hope has been snatched in some ways, in some ways from people today. Um, but we wanna acknowledge that there are still opportunities uh, for change to happen in this context with regards to student loan debt cancellation, and we can still move forward on this front. I wanna read a few quotes from Justice Kagan's dissent. She says, at the behest of a party that has suffered no injury, the majority decides a contested public policy issue properly belonging to the politically accountable branches and the people they represent. In another quote, she says, the majority's opinion begins by distorting standing doctrine uh, to create a case fit for judicial resolution. And lastly, she says, the opinion ends by applying the court's made up major questions doctrine to jettison the secretary's loan forgiveness program. Small wonder, the majority invokes the doctrine. The majority's normal statutory interpretation cannot sustain its decision. The statute read as written gives the secretary broad authority to relieve a national emergency as effect on borrowers' ability to repay their student loans. The secretary did no more than use that lawfully delegated authority. This is a very strange moment and it impacts so many uh, borrowers in particular ways, but I want to focus on the impact on Black and Brown borrowers in particular as we lifted up a brief, uh, an amicus brief before the Supreme Court uh, as these cases were filed. Um, and just to acknowledge that regardless of this unjust uh, SCOTUS ruling, the fight for student debt relief continues and we will not give up. Uh, the letter of the law is clear. Student debt relief is and always has been legal. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has chosen to ignore the plain language of the law and black and brown borrowers have been the hardest hit by the pandemic and student debt and now stand to be the most negatively impacted by the decision. The Biden administration must act swiftly to use other tools to ensure that they can receive relief. Just as we must ensure that black and brown students and all students of color have just and equal access to institutions of higher education, we must also ensure that those students have access to economic prosperity once they leave those institutions. Within the last 24 hours, the Supreme Court has severely limited access to prosperity for Black, Brown, and other minorities on both fronts with their decisions in the affirmative action context and this decision in the Nebraska case. And let's be honest, these were not viable lawsuits. They should have never made it to the Supreme Court to begin with. Uh, and President Biden must move to deliver on his promise of student loan debt relief using other tools before millions of black and brown borrowers and their families are pushed to economic ruin when payments resume. Today, 25% of black borrowers and 50% of brown borrowers could have been on a path to having their student debt completely eliminated. Instead, they will continue to face life altering student debt because of the Supreme Court's ruling. The Biden administration must act swiftly using other tools to ensure that these families can start fresh without the burdens of student debt. The president, made, the president made a promise to over 50, 40 million people. It's up to the president to deliver justice for those student loan borrowers where the Supreme Court has failed. Inaction is not an option. And with this unjust decision, 
the majority of the Supreme Court sp puts special interests in politics ahead of people and delivering justice under the law. This action, this, this decision, in so many ways, places individuals, especially black and brown individuals who have suffered under a racial wealth gap in the lurch. It places them in a position where they're even more economically vulnerable following a national emergency like COVID-19. And now they are susceptible to a moment in which they'll have to figure out what life looks like with the burden of 10 to $20,000 of student debt that could have been eliminated. These are strange times in the last 24 hours have proven this court has not placed an emphasis on those who are already most vulnerable, most vulnerable to economic opportunity today and yesterday, most vulnerable to being shut out of viable uh, educational opportunities. And so we really, really push the administration to move swiftly, to think about alternative paths to ensure uh, economic viability for all Americans, but particularly those who are most vulnerable, uh, namely black and brown individuals. Today's decision is very troubling uh, for many of the reasons that uh, others have suggested, the effects on millions of borrowers, but also because it continues the sea change that this court is forcing upon the country and the law. Um, in this case, you had very clear statutory text allowing for any student loan provisions to be waived or modified. Justice Kavanaugh acknowledged during oral argument that the authority that Congress wrote was, in his words, extremely broad. It was also an emergency statute, which is a context in which it's very common for Congress to deliberately provide extra flexibility to the executive branch to respond quickly to stabilize the country. There should have been an easier case. Congress wrote a clear statute, the executive branch used that authority, and the Supreme Court could have ended its inquiry there by focusing on what the text of the law said. That's the message that we tried to emphasize in the brief that we submitted uh, to the court on behalf of dozens of leading law scholars. Unfortunately, this court has now taken the position that the text of the statute is secondary. Justice Kagan has previously described the major questions doctrine as a get out of text free card for conservative courts. And as she said in her dissent today, the doctrine is quote, a way for this court to negate broad delegations Congress has approved because they will have significant regulatory impacts. The doctrine is an almost infinitely malleable and indeterminate inquiry that explicitly exists to allow courts to disregard the text of the laws and make their own judgment calls about what Congress would have wanted. We see that here where the Congress, where, where the court today declined to give much more clarity about when the doctrine does and doesn't apply. The court noted that the law here involved a lot of money, although they seemed to mistakenly overstate the economic impact by a factor of 10. Uh, and they took it upon themselves to simply ask themselves whether they think Congress would have meant to do this. And the evidence that they turned to was what they called sharp debates about the scope of the HEROES Act in today's current hyperpolarized Congress, 20 years after the original law was passed. It's important to note that this court still has not issued an opinion where it has explicitly found that the major questions doctrine does not apply. And as litigators in the public interest space, we are now seeing major questions doctrine arguments in cases about gun safety, no fly lists, Title IX, gender discrimination, minimum wage for government contractors. We've seen the major questions doctrine argued in at least 35 cases since last year and pursued particularly aggressively by conservative state attorneys general, just as they did here. The outcome of today's ruling and the ones before it is that conservative courts are writing themselves bigger and bigger blank checks to overturn legal executive actions that they don't like and using that power in a way that is unconstrained and deeply erodes the separation of powers in the democracy. These days, if you see a legal challenge to a regulation enter the courts, your intuitions about what Fox News will say about that regulation is probably just as good of an indicator of whether it's legal as what you can glean from a careful reading of prior court cases. That's a very challenging position for the legal system to be in, and throws a number of executive actions into uncertainty going forward. I'll turn it back over to Persis. Thank you so much, Ramon, and thank you to, to my colleagues. I'm going to just quickly wrap up here. Um, and I think I think what you've heard 
for my colleagues, it's pretty simple. The court, the court just got it wrong here today. Um, we've all quoted from Justice Kagan and her dissent, and I'll, I'll just you know throw in throw in this piece again. The Heroes Act makes it clear that the plan was legal. The statute provides the secretary with broad authority to give emergency relief to student loan borrowers, including by usher uh, by alt usual discharge rules. What the secretary did fits comfortably within that delegation. I wish I could say that we were surprised today, but once again, we have seen this court bend to the will of right-wing interests and abandon the needs of vulnerable Americans. The fact that these two cases premised on false facts even made it this far demonstrates the corruption in the courts. This court has accepted the wild premise that the harm to a government contractor somehow confers standing to the state sets a very dangerous precedent. The goal of our public policy should be to help vulnerable students and borrowers, not to line the pockets of the servicers that we hire to help them. But the ray of hope that we have is that as, as the court actually did say in its Brown decision, the plan is independent of any student loan relief the department might craft under the Higher Education Act or any other statute. Critically, this case was about President Biden's use of the HEROES Act to implement debt relief. It was about the announcement that he made back in August using the HEROES Act to do this action, but he has other tools and he must use those other tools. We are calling on the administration to immediately issue an order to deliver relief to the more than 16 million borrowers we already know qualify for this relief. We call on this administration to ensure that all of the borrowers, more than 10 million borrowers who applied but never got notified, have the opportunity to have those applications processed. And, and most importantly, we call on this administration to ensure that the tens of millions of borrowers many of whom are probably our most vulnerable borrowers, the seniors, the low-income folks, the folks who don't have access to the internet, have the chance to apply to get this relief. We know that the payments are resuming in the fall and that that is going to mean financial disaster if this administration does not act and it does not act soon. I wanna thank you all for your time. It is a dark day for 40 million student loan borrowers, but we think that there is reason for hope. And we hope that this administration will act quickly and swiftly to deliver the relief that it promised to 40 million borrowers as soon as it can. Thank you so much. Jackie, I'm gonna turn it back to you for questions. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, that was warp speed brain turnaround, given that we got this decision two hours ago. Um, so now we can move into the question and answer portion. We've already gotten some questions in the chat, so I'll start with those, but please, if you have a question and you want to read it aloud, um, just click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. There's a little hand emoji, so you should be able to see it there. Um, so to start off, actually, I think this is a good one for you, Persis, since you're already speaking. Um, but what other tools are available for the administration to deliver debt, debt relief? That's a big one. That is a big one. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think thinking about the Higher Education Act, it is a very broad statute and it has actually a lot of different places um, where it provides um, where it provides the secretary with the tools to cancel loans. So I think, you know, we're, we're I, I don't want to like nail the administration down because I can't speak for them, but there are ways that it can modify loans. It's ways that it can compromise, it can settle. There are also other tools under federal collection law that it can use in order to do this. I think there's both, both administratively the opportunity for the administration to issue an executive order to deliver relief for folks, but also to create a new program um, under the Administrative Procedures Act. Great, yeah. Um, okay, another question. This one I think is good for you, Abby. Um, so can you talk about the similarities and differences between the Student Loan Forgiveness Plan and the PPP program, either legally or otherwise? And why was one found to be not legal, but then not the other? Sure, thank you. Um, so the, the, the PPP program uh, and the, the student debt forgiveness program were both programs that were established to address the economic impact of the national emergency. Both programs recognized that the pandemic uh, was 
enormously economically disruptive that many, many, many people, um, uh, many businesses were forced to temporarily close. Many people had to uh, cut work. Uh, many, many people, um, uh, parents and mothers in particular, had to had to suddenly stay home and care for their children when schools closed. So there was tremendous economic disruption. Both programs are designed to address that. The Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP program, uh, one big difference is that most of those funds went to business owners and to wealthy people. And studies have subsequently looked at the program and found that that most of those funds uh, went through to, to um, people in the top income percentiles and to shareholders and other uh, members of sort of the, the economic elite. Uh, the student, student debt relief program, in contrast, uh, is really targeted at, at working and middle class people with, with um, 90 percent of, of those relief dollars flowing to, to households and families earning under $75,000 a year. So the, the people targeted for economic relief were really different in the two programs, but both programs were meant to deliver economic relief by, by forgiving or canceling loans uh, in response to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, why, has the, why has the student loan forgiveness program been struck down while the PPP program has not? Well, the, the PPP program wasn't challenged in court. Uh, there, as soon as the, the student loan program was announced, um, uh, all, of the, all of the sort of critics and opponents and a number of billionaire backed organizations came out in force to attack the program and filed lawsuits across the country going after the program. So I think there's um, uh, that that's that's a really significant difference in what we're looking at. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions there. Thank you, Avi. Uh... For the laymen, I think our leaders need to just re-examine their priorities, in my opinion. Um, all right, we've got another great question. Chavis, I think you'd be great for this one. Um, so there's a large number of student borrowers who were expecting to have up to $20,000 canceled. That now won't be. What immediate financial impacts will this have on them? And is there anything that authorities, such as the CFPB or other, can do to mitigate adverse impacts? Yes, uh, senior Biden administration officials have already said time and time again that resuming student loan payments without first canceling student debt will result in catastrophic, a catastrophic wave of uh, unnecessary borrower distress and default. There's uh, data from the CFPB that shows that borrower distress is on the rise with more than 2.5 million borrowers already behind on other forms of debt and nearly 6 million borrowers showing risk of delinquency. Millions have had to wait in economic limbo for nearly a year. And this creates a moment where the, the distress is at a great, great uh, level and folks are trying to figure out what they'll do if these loans uh, are restarted. And prior to the pandemic, over a quarter of borrowers were behind on payments. Nine million borrowers were in default. One borrower defaulted every 26 seconds. And as bad as the numbers are, uh, data from the Department of Education itself show returning to repayment without cancellation will be even worse. And so I think that uh, the department has to use this authority uh, under the Higher Education Act and, and the broad array of tools that come with that authority to figure out something to do uh, to ensure that these borrowers are not left uh, in this economic position. Uh, the plain text of the HEROES Act itself was to ensure that borrowers not, were not placed in a worse position financially than they were prior to the national emergency. That could still happen, that the folks are, uh, experiencing the compounding effects of a global pandemic, of, of an economic crisis, and then to have that uh, added to with additional loan payments and additional debt that they'll now have to deal with. And so I, I hope that uh, the Department of Education uh, and the Biden administration put their collective genius together to figure out ways to ensure that these borrowers are not left in a worse uh, place. Thank you. Um, Persis, did you have something that you wanted to add to that one? I I, I think Chad has got it exactly right. You know, this this is without relief, we're going to see economic devastation, um, and so the administration just needs to act fast and use all of its tools. Great, yeah. Um, I think this is a good one for you, Aman, but anyone can chime in that wants to answer. Um, this ruling seems unprecedented in nature and scope, which we've addressed a bit. Um, has the Supreme Court ever made a ruling that affected the personal finances of tens of millions of Americans 
like this before. How usual or unusual is this for SCOTUS? The Supreme Court has uh, issued major decisions that harm the finances of millions of Americans before. I mean, one that immediately comes to mind was um, when they struck down Medicaid expansion in their uh, evaluation of the Affordable Care Act. I think it is, it's not unprecedented in scope, but it's very troubling. And one would hope that the Supreme Court, when would consider the vast impacts of some of these decisions uh, and act with a little bit more air uh, and caution before issuing such sweeping opinions. But it, it's, it's not the first time and I fear it won't be the last. Yeah, thank you. Um, so another question, I think Abby or Persis, you all might know the answer to this. Um, What's the status of income-driven repayment plans? This is obviously gonna be a lot more relevant now for many more folks. Could the Biden administration make it generous enough for borrowers in a way that withstands legal challenges? I'm, I'm happy to start and I, I'm sure Persis will, will jump in to catch anything that I leave off. Um, in terms of the, the status, uh, President Biden announced um, improvements to income-driven repayment last August at the same time as he announced the debt cancellation plan. Uh, he announced it as part of a complete package that, that cancellation uh, is, is necessary to ensure that borrowers do not have too much debt um, uh, when, when repayments resume and to prevent, to prevent default and distress and relieve the burden now. And then, um, and then improvements to income-driven repayment are needed to ensure that what the debt that borrowers have left after that cancellation is more manageable in the long term. So again, it's part of a, a, a package together, cancellation and income-driven repayment. Um, the Department of Education uh, issued a proposed rule on income-driven repayment in January. And, uh, and we are expecting a, the final rule to, to come out sort of, I think any, any day now, uh, recent reporting said in, in the ensuing weeks, um, but I think it could be, could be soon. Um, after the, the rule is issued, there's still going to be time that it takes to, to implement the rule, meaning to make the new, the new plan available to borrowers. Um, I, there is certainly, there's certainly legal authority to make the, the income-driven repayment plans um, more generous to borrowers, and we expect this plan to be, to be more generous to borrowers, and there's, there's ample authority from Congress to the Secretary of Ed Education to make income-driven repayment plans, and a lot of discretion in terms of how those, those plans are structured and how much borrowers pay under those plans and how long borrowers pay under those plans. So there, there's ample authority there. Uh, one, one note of caution, however, is that, that as important as the income-driven repayment plans are, uh, we know that there's a huge access gap and that the plans have historically failed to reach the borrowers who need them most. That low-income borrowers, Black borrowers uh, with, with low incomes are, often do not access these plans or get kicked out of them because of the red tape and paperwork errors and all the hassle that is needed to stay in these plans and as a result end up defaulting anyway. And so that's, that's one of the concerns is that uh, these plans are, are, are critical and important, um, uh, but they're not sufficient to address the student debt crisis. Thanks, Abby. I, um, I just want to reiterate what Abby started with, that this is, um, that this was a package, right? That there is both a like, how do we get out of this moment, which is the cancellation, and then IDR, income during payment, was one of the, one of the tools to, for us moving forward. But I think it's so critical to understand that income-driven repayment is not enough for this moment. Income-driven repayment cannot be the plan to prevent tens of millions of borrowers from falling into financial distress. When the president made this announcement that they were gonna provide up to $20,000 of debt relief to tens of millions of borrowers, one of the critical pieces that we knew is that about 20 million borrowers would be debt-free after, after that relief goes through. Meaning that both for those borrowers, they would never have to jump through the bureaucratic hurdles that we just heard Abby talk about. You know, that 20 million people would see their balances go to zero. And that is how we move forward. And that is how not just borrowers move forward, but the system moves forward. We know critically that the servicing system is not prepared 
to administer income for any payment for 40 million student loan borrowers. The, the, the system is not prepared to prevent the financial catastrophe that will happen in September if payments resume in the status quo. And so income during payment is important, is an important tool to ensure an affordable option for the borrowers who are left, but it is not the solution to ensuring that we do not have the financial catastrophe that has been predicted by this administration when payments resume without cancellation. Thank you, yeah. Um, we're getting a few more sort of more technical questions. Um, I think it's okay if we don't have answers right away. Like I said before, it's been about two hours, but I'll give it a shot since you guys have been able to answer so many other questions much more quickly than should be physically possible. Uh, so this one, the debt ceiling deal ruled out further extensions to the repayment pause, but can the education department just provide grace periods for missed payments instead? And does federal law put an upper limit to how long those grace periods could be? Anyone can just jump in if you've got a thought on this. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and, and just to start with, right? Like what the debt ceiling deal said is that the payment pause as it's been outlined um, can't can't continue. That said, as we've talked about beforehand, the higher education has a lot. The higher education act, sorry, has a lot of tools in its toolbox in order to help borrowers navigate difficult financial situations. And I think that you know it has a lot of discretion in terms of how payment, when payments are due, how payments are made, and that and those sorts of things. So you know, while while. What we have now cannot continue in the fall. I do think that there are there are definitely um, tools that can be utilized in order to smooth the pathway as the administration turns uh, the payment system back on. Thank you. All right, it looks like we are wrapping up with questions. Um, and I think we've really dug is as far into the weeds as we can for now. Another huge, huge, huge thank you to these legal experts. Really quickly, Sorry, Travis, go ahead. Yes, I, I want to just add a few further points about how this um, would all fuel the racial wealth gap and how it affects women in particular. Um, student loan borrowers' abilities to buy homes, uh, start small businesses, and save for retirement uh, over their lifetimes are all impaired by uh, student debt. Uh, our persistent racial wealth gap means that students of color, especially those who are Black and, and Latinx, are more likely to have student debt, borrow in higher quantities, and face more struggles in repayment. Due to our country's unjust debt finance system of education, about 90% of Black students have to borrow to finance their undergraduate edu educations, compared to 68% of white households. Among all households, roughly one in six white adults, 17%, have any student debt at all compared to more than one out of four, 27% of black adults. Student debt fuels economic, gender, and racial inequality, and black women carry the highest student debt load uh, burdens and finish their post-secondary education with $15,000 more student debt on average uh, than white women. The average black student loan borrower takes on nearly 50% more debt for a bachelor's degree than his or her uh, counterparts in Black borrowers are far more likely to have runaway balances on their federal student loans. Nearly two thirds of black borrowers owe more than they borrowed 12 years after starting school. As it relates to women, women hold two thirds of all college debt and black women hold more than any other group. And so this particular decision has a disproportionate impact on black and brown borrowers, but also on women. And so it is really up to uh, the, the administration to use whatever tools they may have at their disposal, including the array of tools that are presented in the Higher Education Act to ensure that they keep in mind those borrowers who are most susceptible to default and delinquency and those who have taken now disproportionate uh, debt burdens in order to, to, to attend higher education. The promise of education in America should be made available to all and student loan debt makes that an infeasible possibility. And so we must really, really work uh, with all the tools that we have at, at, the, at the governmental level to ensure that we keep an account for the individuals who have dreamed of education and that we make it as possible 
uh, as it can be for those individuals to attend higher education, to attend institutions of higher education without obtaining broad quantities of debt. Today's decision hurts that, but it doesn't halt that possibility that we can make this outcome, uh, the outcome of higher education for all, a much, much closer reality. Thank you, Travis, for jumping in. It is absolutely a driving point that it's black and brown borrowers who will bear the brunt of this hardship. Um, and it's absolutely an attack on racial justice. So I'm glad that that point was made. Um, does anyone else have any other final words? Great. Um, with that then, I think we can officially call it um, a reminder that this was recorded and the recording will be posted on the Student Borrower Protection Center's YouTube channel. Um, there is a link in the advisory, but we'll have it on across all of our pages. So it should be easy to find. Um, and all of our experts will be available for further interview if anyone wants to speak with them. Um, just shoot me an email, jackie at protectborrowers.org. Um, otherwise we'll be in touch. Thank you all so much again.